So I'm trying to record this so that it'll be posted back on YouTube for later viewing. Got it. And then we want to get back to PowerPoint. Let's see, I'll do this first. Like that. Like that. Make sure we're in Mount Wilson. And hopefully that is where oh, you got. Okay. So if you want to go back, you can. Or, or... It's probably a good idea to start with slide one. Are we ready? Oh, boy. As you probably know by now, I came to talk about Mount Wilson Observatory. This is a nice modern picture of Mount Wilson Observatory. It is, as the text suggests, the place where all the brains and the money and the talent and the equipment came together to discover the universe, discover the galaxy, and really to give birth to the entire modern list of astronomical sciences. You have to remember that history happens because people make decisions, people decide to do things whatever observatory you want. Mount Wilson Observatory exists because of two men, George Ellery Hale on the right and Andrew Carnegie on the left. George Hale was the driving intellectual force and he was a force to be reckoned with to create Mount Wilson Observatory. And Andrew Carnegie, who was another force to be reckoned with, happened to be the richest man in the world and is still one of the richest men in world history. He was worth hundreds of billions of dollars. <clears throat> he uh, decided in his older years to give away all of his money, and he gave away a lot of it to various organizations. He established like 23 philanthropic organizations, one of them being what is now the Carnegie Institute for Science. And one of the people who was looking for money was George Hale, who had an amazing talent to do things nobody had ever done before and push the envelope of every science and technology he could find and create Mount Wilson Observatory. So remember these guys. I'm not going to talk anymore about Andrew Carnegie. I'm going to be talking about George and about Mount Wilson Observatory. But remember that this is Mount Wilson Observatory is the first, maybe the first, real good example of very serious scientific ambition being supported by very serious money. And I'll show you later on in the talk what happens when you're ambitious, but you don't have any money. So the first thing I want to talk about is George Hale and say the prehistory of Mount Wilson Observatory. So here's a picture of little Georgie whose father got rich in making elevators for Chicago after the Great Chicago Fire. He had a fair amount of money, and George was really kind of a child prodigy. He was really very uh, anxious to learn. He was out studying whenever he could. His father was a very practical man, so George learned how to machine, how to build things, make things. And he was really interesting in the new science of physics. And I put some timeline up here to show you that he was born at a time when the science of physics, which we think of as being a well-developed thing, was really being born. Uh, James Maxwell had not yet really made his final theory of electromagnetism. He did that after George was born. We had to wait for Boltzmann to come along and invent entropy and statistical mechanics, but Clausius had done his second law. And the important thing to notice here in 1859, at the button, there we go, 1859, Kirchhoff and Bunsen did their work to make spectroscopy a laboratory science. So all these things were new and were happening when he was a little guy and he was really interested in doing it. As you can see from the bottom line, he was at MIT studying physics from 1886 to 1890. And so this picture of him is about the time he graduated, about the time he was a student. As you can see from the list, he went up pretty fast in the professional rankings. He was really ambitious. And by the time 
He was a professor of bachelor physics at uh, Belvoir College, which was uh, associated with the University of Chicago. He was already only, what, 23 years old, and he was a full professor. And he went on to found Yerkes Observatory, which at the time was the most prestigious observatory in the world. And he took over as director of the observatory, which he had actually helped to find when he was 29 years old. So it wasn't even 30 yet, and he's directing the most prestigious observatory in the world, only to replace it with another most prestigious observatory in the world, most many uh, most observatory. And that's what we really want to get to. When he was a student, and I should go back and remind you of this, when he was a student first thing, 1889, he invented a thing called the spectral heliograph. And this is uh, two images out of one at Kenwood Observatory, which was pictured in the previous slide that his father built for him at the family mansion in Kenwood, a suburb of Chicago. This device allows for the first time imagery of the sun in one single spectral emission line. So if you want to look only at the light that comes from the element hydrogen or iron or oxygen or whatever, this device will let you do it. And this is the business end of it. And this moves a glass plate over the emission from a spectral slit, which allows you to get this image all in the same spectral line. So it's a mechanical device and didn't always work perfectly, but he was using it at Kenwood and was using it at Earpiece and used it with great success at Mount Wilson Observatory. Here's some pictures of Yerkes Observatory. I was pleased to go there last October. This is not one of my pictures. This is a picture from the Yerkes Observatory website, which does a much better job featuring the telescope in its full glory. It was not the biggest telescope in the world at the time, but it was the best telescope in the world at the time. He went from Yerkes to Mount Wilson. Now, George, as a student, worked at Harvard College Observatory for a year where he studied spectroscopy and later went to Germany to study spectroscopy even more. But he knew about Mount Wilson because there was a secret plot, actually not so secret, between Harvard College and USC to build an observatory on Mount Wilson. The glass that went into the lenses of the Yerkes 40 inch telescope was supposed to go into the telescope that was on Mount Wilson. This telescope over here on the left is a test telescope, a, a 13 inch, I think, that was um, sent to Mount Wilson to test the site. So these are Boston people. <clears throat> You would think in Boston they know what winter is, but no, they came to Mount Wilson in one of the worst winters in a hundred years and decided, no, we really don't like hanging around here. And probably during the summer, they saw snakes for the first time, especially rattlesnakes. And the first thought that comes to mind is, you no know, biblical serpent from hell were going back to Boston. And they were not terribly happy. And Spence, with the guy with the money who was going to pay for it, died and didn't put it in the will. But probably the thing that bothered them the most was Godzilla coming up over the mountains. And so he had snakes, Godzilla, snow, we're out of here. And so Harvard College did not build their observatory here. Yerkes got the glass, and George remembered Mount Wilson, and he came back and started Mount Mount Wilson Solar Observatory in 1904. These are the three solar telescopes, the horizontal snow telescope, the 60-foot tower, and then the taller 150-foot tower in the back. From 1905, when the snow started doing science, until 1962, these were the biggest, most powerful, and most useful solar telescopes in the world. If you wanted to study the sun, you came to Mount Wilson. The horizontal telescope, when the sun shined, it was originally canvas, it was not covered with metal like this. Um, when the sun shines on it, the air convects inside the building and rises 
perpendicular to the direction the light is going in the building, and that makes your image of the sun twinkle, just like a star. And as you all know by now, poets like twinkling astronomers don't. Astronomers would be happiest if there was no air at all, and that way the stars would not twinkle, but of course then you drop dead in your telescope and it wouldn't work. So we have to put up with the air being there. But George decided, well, what if I could pick it up and make it vertical? Now the air will rise parallel to my light and not perpendicular to it, and that makes most of the twinkling go away. So he built the 60-foot tower, which had the same focal length as the horizontal snow, and that worked really well, so he immediately built the 150-foot tower behind him. So what comes out? Well, first thing, in 1904, mules. You know, they didn't have big trucks, they didn't have big cars, they had mules. And so originally Mount Wilson Observatory went up on mules and carts. And Walter Adams writes about one of the mules um, who had perfect tail hair and was retired from the mule train duty that you see here and lived the life of Riley while they harvested the tail hairs to make crosshairs for eyepieces for guiding while they're making images. So if you're the right mule in the right place at the right time, that's great. So the first science to come out of the Snow Solar Telescope is why are sunspots dark? Now you might think it's fairly obvious they're dark because they're cooler than the rest of the sun, but that's not obvious in 1907. In fact, you can argue that they were darker because they were hotter than the rest of the sun, and it's a complicated affair, but yes, you can make that argument. But George did spectroscopy. He studied it when he was a kid, and even when he was a little kid, he was building his own spectroscope. Spectroscopically, he determined that the reason sunspots were dark is because they are at a lower temperature, and he writes about that in this paper with Walter Adams in 1907. This was a big deal back then. We may not think of it as a big deal, but it was a big deal back then. It was the beginning of his real serious research into the physics of the sun. And uh, I will show you a good reason in a few minutes why I, even though George Hale is referred to as an astronomer by almost everyone, I don't think of him as an astronomer because I am a physicist and he was a physicist who did astronomy in order to solve his physics problem. Maybe that makes him an astronomer, but if you're a physicist, you try to push that ahead of the astronomy. You've all seen the cartoon with the top gang of astrophysicists pushing the astronomers away from the telescope. So these are the very first hydrogen alpha images of the sun. Some of you probably have your own solar telescopes do your own hydrogen alpha observing. It started at Mount Wilson Observatory using the Snow Solar Telescope. The first image on the left, the one from March, was made on a night of bad seeing, in, or day, I should say, of bad seeing in clouds. Doesn't look too good. The image on the right looks much better at good seeing, and you can see this, for instance, is an arc above American flag. This is July 1st, 1917. In April of 1917, the U.S. went into World War I, and there was a lot of war patriotism going on at the time, and there were American flags all day. So while the rest of the world is shooting itself to pieces, the United States is building the world's biggest telescope again. Here it is compared with the 60 inch. Now, one of George Hale's habits was that he was driven to do things so maniacally, so fast, that he never waited for one project to be done before starting the next project. So on the very same day when the mirror blank was being placed into the 60 inch telescope, the blank for the 100-inch mirror arrived in Pasadena. He was already making the 100-inch telescope, and he didn't even know if the 60-inch would work. There were arguments about whether or not it could perform properly because of 
the effect of seeing in the atmosphere. Just astronomers didn't really understand that well at the time. He just kept plowing ahead and don't worry, it'll work, it'll work, it'll work. And so you hear the 60 inch, the 100 inch is also sitting on Mercury and there's some Mercury down here, not here by then. Uh, well, no, this, this Mercury flow is also not seen. And you notice that if you want to go north, the telescope will crash into the pier. So when they built the 200 inch at Palomar, which is named the Hale Telescope after George L. Lee Elkin, it was his baby too. They redesigned the north bearing so you could, like a horseshoe, so you could settle the telescope into it. But at the time, believe it or not, the 100 inch telescope was the southernmost very large telescope in the world. There were no big telescopes in the Southern Hemisphere. And being able to look south over the relatively small town of Los Angeles that has changed since then uh, was a premium. And so this English yoke mount to bear the 100 ton moving weight of the telescope, you can see the 100 inch can just look flat right down over Los Angeles but it can't look north, but nobody worried about that because the 60 inch telescope can swing around and look north if it needs to. So there you are. It's the same focal ratios on the 60 inch 100 inch and the 200 inch, except prime focus on the 200 inch is shorter, but they're all three F16 Cassegrain and, and F3 Coudet. And uh, John Hooker donated $45,000 to pay for the mirror. Here is the 100 inch mirror. The 60 inch mirror looks really great. It's nice, clean, pristine glass, not so the 100 inch mirror. Another of George Hale's habits was when he encountered a technology, he would force it to break. He would just push every technology to the limit until it couldn't do anymore. Because the 60 inch mirror works so well, let's have a 100. 100 inch mirror, what the heck? Make me a 100 inch mirror. Well, that pushed the glass making technology to its breaking point. Eight times they tried to make a mirror. Mirror number three survived. The first two did not in the annealing process. They shipped it and it was rejected. And this is why it was rejected. You can see looking at the edge of the mirror, there are lots and lots of bubbles. The, the mirror was made by pouring glass, going and filling up the ladle while the glass sat there in a little skin of cooler glass formed on top. Then you pour more glass on top of that. You have three layers of glass, two layers of bubbles. It's hot glass during annealing. It's good. There's going to be convective currents in the fluid glass, and that spreads the bubbles around. And then you look at the edge of the mirror, and this is what it, it looks like. Now, here's the surface of the mirror, and here are the bubbles. When you first get this mirror, are we going to dig down deep enough to expose these bubbles? And if the answer is yes, we throw it in the trash can because you can't use it. If the answer is no, that's good. George Ritchie said, I refuse to work with this horrible thing. And they made five more attempts and then gave up. The Sangaban Glassworks in France said, look, this, we just can't do it. You got one, it works, use it. And so George used it but a lot of grumbling from George Ritchie. Not only did he not like using this glass, he wanted to make a different optical configuration, Ritchie Cratian, and went to Hooker and told Hooker to tell Hale, do it my way, and that's insubordination. And anybody's book, and George Ritchie had to seek employment elsewhere. But he did finish the mirror, and both the 16-inch and 100-inch mirrors are diffraction limited which means that if you improve the mirror any further, you will not improve the performance of the mirror at the wavelengths that you are observing. So it's useless to anybody except George Ritchie. A lot of modern telescope mirrors were not made diffraction limited because they have an atmosphere above them and it just wasn't worth the cost too much. So when the uh, first test beds for adaptive optics came out, they did it at Mount Wilson Observatory because we had big diffraction limited mirrors that would prove the adaptive optics concept. And I, while I don't have a slide on it here, I should point out that adaptive optics is in fact another Mount Wilson Observatory invention. Uh, and uh, if you download, uh, let's see, I think it was the 2021 issue of Reflections from the Mount Wilson Observatory website, I wrote an article about it. 
But no, adaptive object was not invented by the department, uh, Defense Department. It was invented by, it was Harold Babcock, Horace, maybe, at Mount Wilson Observatory. Everything was invented at Mount Wilson. Just assume that in, in the early day. Now, somebody was asking me about glass plates earlier and whether they were positive or negative images. Here is a glass plate. It's a negative image. This is uh, the plate that uh, made Edwin Hubble famous, shall we say. So uh, in the planetarium, we were talking about spiral nebula and galaxies. And of course, at the time, uh, there was quite an argument amongst astronomers. What are these spiral things? Are they very, very distant stellar networks or are they very, very near clouds of dust and gas? And there was actually evidence to support both arguments you needed some way to break the degeneracy. And one of the arguments was that nova, which we know are very bright, show up preferentially in the preferential, in the spiral arms of spiral nebula. So and since they look dim, they must be far away. So Edwin Hubble was looking for nova, which is kind of a small stellar explosion. And he found several of them and he marked them with the letter N, which you can see here on the plot. He wanted to show that if there were lots of nova in the spiral nebula and not outside the spiral nebula, then that would tell you that they're collections of stars because nova is kind of an exploding star. But one of his nova went away and came back and then went away and came back. And he realized that's not a nova, it's a variable star. So up here in the corner and then in big red letters, he crossed out the N and wrote B-A-R. This was the first variable star, the first Cepheid variable, certainly observed in M31, and the first variable star seen outside the Milky Way galaxy. This is one of Henrietta Leavitt's variables, the ones that Harlow Shapley used to map out the Milky Way galaxy. And Hubble set himself to work mapping out the universe using the same method that Shapley had used to map out the Milky Way galaxy. So here is, uh, here is a picture of Edwin Hubble and looking at his uh, M31 galaxy. He first published NGC 6822, a nearby dwarf galaxy uh, in 1925, then M33 in 1926, and M31 in 1929. Remember that this was in March of 1929, and that's going to become important. The first distance I've given you here is the distance that Edwin Hubble gave. We know a lot more about Cepheid variables now. We know a lot more about a lot of things. And we now know that these things are much farther away. And that's the distance in uh, parentheses is the distance that we know it is now. And throughout the history of astronomy, when people finally discover how far away things are, they always discover they're a lot farther away than anybody ever thought they were. And this is a case in point. The Hubble's distances are very, very far away, even by standards of the day, well known to be well outside the Milky Way galaxy. And therefore, in my language, at Mount Wilson Observatory, we discovered the Milky Way galaxy because nobody actually knew it existed the way we think of it now until Harlow Shapley did his work. And we discovered the entire universe because that's what Edwin Hubble did with his Cepheid variables and proving the existence of other galaxies. We discovered the entire universe. Now, meanwhile, in the 1950s, a German astronomer named Walter Body, who had come to Mount Wilson Observatory, discovered a mistake that Hubble and uh, Shapley had made. And he, by fixing their mistake, instantly doubled the size and age of the universe at a time when Big Bang cosmology and steady state cosmology were arguing with each other over who was better. And uh, it appeared that the oldest stars in the universe were younger than the universe. And that was a problem in Big Bang cosmology that went away when uh, Bade fixed the problem. Walter Bade was a German citizen, and when World War II broke out, he was an enemy alien and couldn't be allowed to go to something as sensitive to our military security as an observatory. So he was stuck at home until 
Milton Hummison, who was assisting Edmund Hubble with his spectroscopy, took body and the army officer in charge of enemy aliens out to the bar and they sat around and had a few beers and when they were over suddenly Walter Bonnet could go up to the observatory. So not all critical international decisions are made over a negotiating table. Sometimes they're made at the pub and in this case it worked perfectly and Walter Bonnet was an astronomer condemned by law to using the world's largest telescope all by himself over a city blacked out half the time because everybody was afraid the Japanese would bomb it. Uh, what else could you ask for if you're an astronomer? And so he used that to discover the mistake that Hubble and Chaplin had made. Edwin Hubble also discovered that the universe was expanding. This is the redshift distance relationship plotted from his original paper. And he published this in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in March 1929, which is the same month that he published the distance to M31 in the Astrophysical Journal. So in 1929, we discovered the universe and we discovered it was doing something. Uh, the only problem with this plot is that Edwin Hubble forgot to mention that while the distance were his, he used the Cepheid variables to get the distance. All of the velocities here, the recession velocities were measured by Vesto Sleeper at Lowell Observatory using the 24 inch Clark refractor. And Hubble forgot to mention he was using someone else's data when he published the paper, which caused a bit of a flat, but you know, they got over it eventually. And then he went on to work with Milton Hummerson extending this relationship and very far. And so the discovery of the expanding universe, the discovery of the universe, the discovery of the Milky Way, all comes from Mount Wilson Observatory. Another thing that George Hale was really interested in was infrared astronomy. And remember, you can't do it with a refractor because it won't penetrate the glass. So he measured the radiation from stars, tried to measure the temperature of stars at Yerkes Observatory, didn't quite work. But uh, Seth Nicholson and Edison Pettit set up a consistent program of infrared astronomy with the 100 inch telescope, measured the uh, infrared emission from about 100 stars and from all the planets. And one of the things they did of particular interest to me was stare at a spot on the moon during a lunar eclipse while the shadow of the Earth moved over that spot. And they watched the temperature go down. And from the time it takes the temperature to go down, you can get the thermal inertia of the surface. And if you have the thermal inertia of the surface, you know if it's covered by dust or not. And they published in, I think, 1929 or so, that indeed the moon had no deep dust cover. It couldn't because the thermodynamics of the surface were all wrong. And if the Apollo moon people had read the astrophysical journal, they would already know that we had proved decades earlier at Mount Wilson, they didn't need to worry about dust kicking up, but they didn't read it. And so they sent rangers and surveyors. And that was probably a good idea anyway, but they really didn't need to worry about dust. That was something we already knew. So we know everything at Mount Wilson. Just remember that. So this is the very first stellar interferometer. Uh, Albert Michelson, who, uh, uh, who was a Nobel laureate, well, I think he's the first American Nobel laureate. He was very interested in the speed of light. It's the Michelson from the Michelson-Morley experiment, which you know, disproved, uh, at least in theory, the existence of the uh, famous luminiferous ether, ether, and there's that's another old talk too. But uh, this bar, on top of the 100 inch telescope has a couple of movable mirrors on it and you move those mirrors around and the light comes down, bounces off the primary mirror, mixes and goes to an eyepiece at the Cassegrain position and the astronomer looks and sees not an image, but interference fringes. Two patterns of interference fringes caused by the optics. One pattern stays fixed and the other pattern moves as you move the outer mirrors. And when the moving pattern disappears, you know that the separation distance between the mirrors on the telescope correlates to the angular size of the thing you're looking at. 
and they measured the angular diameter of several stars. Of particular interest is Alpha Orionis, otherwise known as Betelgeuse, the red supergiant. And they got an angular diameter of 0.047 arc seconds, which is right. I mean, it's about the same angular diameter we use today. But they didn't realize how far away it was. And so they, uh, astonished by its large size, suggested that it, it was um, slightly less than the orbit of Mars in diameter. We now know that its actual diameter is slightly less than the orbit of Jupiter. It is significantly larger uh, than people thought it was and probably farther away, although the distance to Bailey's is horrifyingly difficult to get. This was the first exercise in optical astronomical interferometry and we continue that tradition today at Mount Wilson Observatory with the Chara Array from Georgia State University, not Georgia Tech. Be very careful if you go to Mount Wilson and you say Georgia Tech, a bunch of rabid Georgia State people will come after you. So make sure you say Georgia State. So in the big dome in the middle is the 100 inch dome. Here's the 60 inch dome. And there are six telescopes labeled E12, W12, S123, East, West, South. You notice that the East one, the W1, and the South one telescopes are all exactly the same distance from this point near the center. And they sit on the same circle. That's not an accident. We want the telescope space that way with the E, W, and S2 telescopes in the middle. What you do is you combine the light from all six telescopes or from however many telescopes you're using, and you can do uh, things like measure the diameter of the stars or measure what the stars uh, look like on their surface. I'm going to show you some of the results that come from the char rays. This is what it looks like inside the beam combining room. The laboratory where the actual combining and interferometry is done is back in here. These mirrors move back and forth to adjust the light travel time. Because if you go back to this slide, suppose you're looking at a source that's in the southern sky. As the light comes along, it will hit the S1 and S2 telescopes before it gets to the west or the east telescopes. And you think of the light coming to you as a plane wave, as physicists think of it. Think of a sheet of paper, a sheet of light coming this way you need to sample the very same sheet of light with all six telescopes. So the light from the south telescopes has to get here and wait so the light can make it to the east telescopes and get back. So those moving carts move around to adjust the travel time and the light so it all comes together correctly and then is fed to the interferometer. And when you do that, you can do stuff like this. These are all rapid rotating stars. And when I mean and say rapid, I mean like really rapid. If you look at Regulus, for instance, it's over four times the physical size of the sun. And it takes 16 hours to spin around once. That's really fast. It's so fast that the star is squished. So that this is, it's real. If you look at it, that's its real shape. And these are data from the Chara array that show you the real shape of the star. And it also shows you that the poles are brighter relatively than the equator, as should be the case for a rapidly rotating star. In the case of Regulus and Ross al Haig, we see that equator on and beta cast, it's almost pole on. And in fact, Vega is a pole on rapid rotator. Um, and there's other stars, you can see the, the, uh, the period, this number down here, 16H40, this is the period. So you can see they're all just hours, rapid rotators. I've got the solar mass, solar radius, and solar luminosity is what the LSRSMS means. So you can see this is, Regulus is 316 times brighter than the sun and so on. And these uh, are the distances, 80 light years, 49, 17, they're fairly nearby. Uh, the, the Chara Array is the only instrument in the world that can do this. Nothing else can do it. So if this is the kind of thing you want to study, there's only one place you can go to do it. 
and that's Mount Wilson Observatory, which used to be the only place you could go to do astrophysics throughout the entire first half of the 20th century. So we remain the only place you need to go. I know you think you've been to several observatories, but there's really only one that you need to worry about. That's Mount Wilson. I, they were they were great at Yerkes. I really appreciated going to, to visit Yerkes. I, I tried to hold my time the entire time. And this is the expanding fireball for Nova Delphini 2013. By looking at the angular expansion rate, so you know how fast it's moving on the sky, and you look at the spectrum to get the radial velocity of the gas from the Doppler ship, now you can do geometry and get a distance to this, which is something you couldn't do before. And they got a distance a little less than 15,000 light years, most likely. And this allows you to model the explosion, in this case, with an optically thick cord to, surrounded by an optically thin envelope. But these are things you can't do unless you have a tool like the char array to do it for you. And if you remember back in the old days, Epsilon Auriga would dim with a 27 year period. And the, the dimming would last maybe a couple of years. And there was speculation as to why this was not the behavior of a regular variable star. And the speculation was we have a companion star with a dust disk around it. But the people at the Char Array were able to direct directly image this with the interferometer and see the black disk surrounding the companion star as it moved in front of the parent star. That's not bad. So all of these things, and they're now looking at um, active galactic nuclei. They've been looking at stars for the longest time, but now they're looking at AGN and the closer you look into the AGN, the closer you get to the internal black hole. And now you can start studying the accretion disk dynamics the closer you get. And so it's a really interesting affair. So this, I want to leave you, this is my last slide. I want to leave you with an impression for how unbelievably fantastic and unique Mount Wilson Observatory is. I've mentioned this before, but you probably didn't catch on to what it really means. So I'm going to point out all three solar telescopes in the 150 foot, the 60 foot, and the snow, they were the largest solar telescopes in the world from 1905 to 1962. The 100 inch, and 60 inch telescopes were the largest nighttime telescopes in the world from 1908 to 1917. So there are five telescopes right there constructed over a period of 13 years, each one of which was the largest in the world when it was built. And you can add to that the Chara array, and here are the E telescopes in the west and the south. It is the largest of its kind in the world. That's six things on this one campus, all of which either are now or were when they were made, the largest telescope in the world. Aside from Mount Wilson Observatory, only one other observatory right up until now in the entire history of astronomy has ever had more than one telescope on its campus that was the largest in the world. And that's the Keck Observatory on Mauna Kea when they built the twin 10 meter telescopes, Keck 1 and Keck 2. They were the largest telescopes in the world. There were two of them. That's the only competition. You will not find more than one telescope on any other observatory anywhere ever that was the largest in the world. And here there are five built in a period of 13 years that tells you something about how George Hale was driven to accomplish things that other people never did and never could accomplish. And I don't think he was thinking in terms of, well, I'm going to do these things that nobody ever did before. He was thinking in terms of, I got to do this thing, I'm going to do it. Now I got to do that thing, I'm going to do it. 
and whether or not anybody else had ever done it before, because it wasn't part of the thinking process. It was like, I have to do this thing. And, and then he did it. And so this makes Mount Wilson Observatory incredibly unique, if unique needs an advertisement. And uh, I hope I left enough time to answer all your questions and I'm done, thank you.